Okay, let's go ahead and pick it up here. This is part four on our series on God's existence. So we'll pick it up here on some of the issues with design arguments. Now, once again, as we said before, the question we're asking is nature purposeful or purposeless? That means, is there a purpose to nature at all? And as I said before, historically, many people, including scientists, have believed several aspects of nature was deliberately planned, directed, or designed. So design arguments are known as teleological arguments, and that means that they see certain features of nature having a goal, end goal, or purpose to them. That means whether it be things in the universe or things on Earth itself or the human body or features of nature seem to have a purpose to them. And so that's what we're dealing with with design arguments. So let's go over one right here that's pretty well known. It's called the fine tuning of the universe argument. And in the last 50 years, scientists have discovered that the universe is analogous to a biosphere. Its basic structure must be precisely set for life to exist. And a little analogy here, uh, we know there was the Arizona biosphere from 1991 to 1994. They had to, everything had to be constructed just right for it to be self-sustaining. And then, of course, after that, it failed in two years. And so, as we say on the left here, in the last 50 years, scientists have discovered the universe is analogous to a biosphere. Its basic structure must be precisely set for life. And this is called the fine-tuning of the cosmos. Now, I don't pretend to cover everything about this discussion, so once again, I'm going to recommend some books for you. Uh, there is The Privileged Planet that came out a ways back. You can get that book. There's Brian Greene's Elegant Universe, Hugh Ross's Why the Universe is the Way It Is. One of the most well-known books that's come out recently is by Luke Barnes called A Fortunate Universe. He's a physicist out of Australia. I recommend that book. That also deals with a lot of the arguments against fine-tuning. And then, of course, Hugh Ross his book, Improbable Planet. That has more to do with the fine-tuning of planet Earth, because without the right planet, we do not have life as well. Now, if you want to read some of Luke Barnes' stuff, there's a PDF online. Go to his blog as well. But He also has YouTube clips. You can look up some of his stuff and follow along with what he's saying, but he certainly knows all the arguments against the fine-tuning arguments. So if you're just going to Google things online, and find arguments against a fine-tuning argument, I recommend you look up Luke Barnes' work as well. And he even responded to Victor Stinger's book, which called The Fallacy of Fine-Tuning, why, uh, why actually Stinger is incorrect. And so if you look up some of, some of Luke Barnes' work online, there is an exchange, I think, between him and Stinger. At least he is responding to Stinger's work. So feel free to look that up as well online. And of course, he responds to some of that stuff in his book. Now, remember the term fine-tuned does not necessarily mean designed. Fine-tuning just means that the range of life permitting values for the constants and quant quantities is extremely narrow. And in the absence of fine-tuning, not even matter nor even chemistry would much exist, much less planets or life might even evolve itself. Now, some of the scientists or physicists who accept the universe is fine-tuned for life include some that are certainly not Christian theists. You have John Barrow, Bernard Carr, Paul Davies, Stephen Hawking, and others, Roger Penrose, J Martin Rees. Some of the names here, people are definitely not uh, believers in God or anything. They just agree that the universe is definitely fine-tuned. They just don't agree why it's fine-tuned. Stephen Hawking wrote, the laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge of the electron and the ratio of the masses of the protein electron. He says, a remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been finally adjusted to make life possible for the development of life on Earth, that's what Hawking said. So we talk about the constants. We say that we're constants. We're talking about the force of gravity. The electromagnetic force and the subatomic weak force, these unchanging quantity, quantities are called constants. Conditions, we say the word conditions, we're talking about this is the amount of matter and energy that was present at the beginning of the universe. And the fine tuning argument asks why these conditions were at such an optimal level to allow the evolution of intelligent life. 
And remember, if you're going to argue for both chemical or biological evolution, nine or one of those things can happen if the universe isn't a life permitting one. So a lot of times what we do is we always argue over issues of biological evolution before we even discuss the issue of chemical evolution or how life can come from non-life. But we need to remember neither one of those things are possible if we don't have the right universe and the right Earth, of course. So let's just remember that when we get in discussions about this topic. As William Lane Craig says, in order for evolution to take place anywhere in the universe, the initial cosmic conditions had to be incomprehensibly fine-tuned. Martin Rees, who is not a believer in God, even said in his book, Just Six Numbers, the mathematics required for human life boils down to six numbers. These numbers were built into the Big Bang and must have precise values they possess for our world to be hospitable to humans. He says, even if any of the numbers are different, even to the tiniest degree, there would be no stars, no complex life elements, no life. He said, even if the gravity were stronger, stars would burn out very quickly and the planets that orbited them would be tiny. And even in a 2009 article, a new scientist magazine says, if the expansion of space had overwhelmed the pull of gravity in the newborn universe, stars, galaxies, and humans would have never been able to form. If, on the other hand, gravity had been much stronger, stars and galaxies might have formed, but they would have quickly collapsed in on themselves and each other. What's more, the gravitational distortion of space-time would have folded up the universe in a big crunch. Our cosmic history would have been over by now. So as Rhee says here, the density of matter in the universe, he talks about the density of matter in the universe in the first seconds of the universe's existence. Matter could not have differed in density by more than one part in a quadrillion. If matter were more dense or if the matter were more crowded together, it would have been a big crunch that collapsed the universe. If matter were less dense or spread out, it would have kept the galaxies from forming as the universe rapidly expanded. He goes on to talk about the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is what contains the protons inside the atoms. Take two magnets and try to touch the positive ends of each magnet together. They repel right as it requires strength to get them to touch much the same way the protons and an atom have a positive charge, so we would expect them to fly away from each other. But the strong force holds them together, so why does the force, this force, need to be fine-tuned? If the strong force was 2% weaker, then hydrogen atoms would repel one another, and there would be only hydrogen atoms in the universe. Now, of course, we know the universe had a beginning. That's pretty well documented in cosmology right now. And we know the expansion at the rate of the Big Bang, if it was greater, so the early universe expanded faster, the matter in the universe would have become so diffuse that the gravity could never gather into the stars and galaxies. If it was less, the early universe expanded more slowly. Gravity could have been overwhelmed. Gravity could have overwhelmed the expansion, pulled all the right matter back into a black hole. The expansion rate was just right, so the universe could have stars in it. Something else that's probably one of the most interesting, interesting points about this discussion is a fine tuning the cosmological constant. And the cosmological constant is a term in Einstein's theory of gravity that influences the expansion rate of empty space. It can be positive or negative. Unless it is within an extremely narrow range around zero, the universe will either collapse or expand too rapidly for galaxies and stars to form. Galactic habitable zone, habitable zone, I'm sorry, is our place in the Milky Way where it says it's just right. If we were closer to the galactic center, we would be bombarded by dangerous radiation and comets. If we were closer to the edge, the sun would have fewer of the heavy elements needed to form planets. The Earth itself, if our planet were much smaller, it would not be able to hold an atmosphere or generate the strong Magnetic field that protects us from cosmic rays. If the Earth were much larger, the increased gravity would be more atro atmospheric pressure and less surface relief. In fact, the planet might be entirely covered in water. And remember, the Earth is suited for scientific discovery. Earth's position in the Milky Way, about halfway between the galactic center and its visible edge, is just about ideal for making astronomical observations, giving us a 
fairly clear view of nearby stars as well as distant galaxies. And this is discussed in the book Rare Earth by Peter Ward, who's a geologist, and Donald Brownlee, uh, who is uh, an astronomer. They say if some godlike being could be given the opportunity to plan a sequence of, of events with the express purpose of duplicating our garden, even that power would face a formidable task. It is unlikely that Earth could ever be truly duplicated. So when you see these articles online that they found another planet that's just like Earth, that it's total nonsense. Uh, there's so many things that go into finding a planet that is just like Earth. So many factors are involved. So as my friend Michael Strauss, a physicist, says, that is just misleading to the public to come out with these articles. So let's make sure we do our homework before we just jump to say, whoa, they found another Earth that's just like planet, and that settles that. They know they have not, and there's a lot of research that has to be done to even show we have anything that's like our Earth. Now, someone might say, all the universes are equally improbable. One of them by chance has to win. Perhaps you can look at a giant container here with a bunch of balls in them, and then maybe one will pop out. Example, you might have all these universes out there, and one will eventually pop out if you keep using the machine here and just turn it hundreds, hundreds and millions of times, and one might eventually pop out, right? So that argument is basically saying eventually we'll get the right universe. But why against overwhelming odds, you got a life permitting ball rather than a life prohibiting ball is the issue, right? Because we're talking about why we got a life permitting universe. That's what we need to ask. So the question is not addressed by saying, well, some ball just had to be picked, right? Now, a common objection is no explanation is needed for why you observe a life permitting universe, because this is the only kind of universe we can observe. So. They say sometimes if the universe are not life permitting, then we wouldn't even be here to ask about it. But that doesn't work. For example, if you had a bunch of people lined up with their rifles to shoot at a man blindfolded against a brick wall, and they all shot him from about five feet away, and they missed him, I highly doubt the man would just take off his blindfold and say, oh, well, I guess you missed. I don't know why you missed. I wouldn't ask that question. Of course, he wouldn't say that. He would say, he would say, how in the world did you miss me? Why did this happen? So sometimes just to say that we don't need to ask the why question, why the universe is a life permitting universe is really showing a lack of an explanatory explanation. And it shows a worldview that doesn't explain anything. So remember that uh, to think you're off the hook just because you can say, well, we're here to observe everything around us, and that settles that. That does not explain anything. Now, sometimes people say in objection to design arguments, they say if God is a perfect designer, why are some things designed so poorly? Of course, one issue would have to be a theological issue. If the fall has caused a lot of problems, the creation is off. We know that the fall of man in this world has definitely taken place, and we know that Actually, there's a lot of books that talk about that as well. But we know the fall has caused a lot of damage in the world. But also remember number three here, su suboptimal design doesn't mean there's no design. Obviously, things around us everywhere we know are not optimally designed, but they're still designed. We know that all design requires trade-offs. Laptop computers must strike a balance between size, weight, and performance. Larger cars may be more safe and comfortable but they are also more difficult to maneuver and consume more fuel. So before we talk about what perfect design is, let's make sure we look at what we're talking about. So that's something we want to remember when we talk about objecting to design arguments.